Thank you. My name is Mark Morano. I come to you from Washington, D.C. And it's actually a very uh, big improvement the last couple years in Washington in terms of uh, agendas for liberty. It really has been a, you know, I, I like to say about President Trump, no other Republican nominee, let alone president, since Ronald Reagan has been able to come in and just stand up to the establishment. Forget about any specific policies. If, no, if we don't learn anything else from Donald Trump it, other than how to handle the mainstream media, Republicans will have taken a great lesson because Donald Trump handles the media unbelievably well. Uh, he calls it like he sees it and you know, the whole fake news phrase. And, and what's happened, especially since Trump's been elected, they become so polarized. And nowhere is that more polarized than on the issue of climate. So first of all, thank you for inviting me here. I got my book here, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Climate Change, which came out last year. And they actually have the new edition here, which uh, has the bonus chapter on the Green New Deal. <laughs> I just testified in front of Congress and they adapted the chapter. In February, I, I testified before the uh, House uh, Natural Resources Committee on the Green New Deal. And uh, Ocasio-Cortez was scheduled to be there and then she found out there was going to be full of, uh, you know, a pack of evil deniers and she backed out. Uh, and we actually held a press conference outside the Capitol. There's some really good congressmen uh, out there in the, from the Western Caucus who are leading the charge against the Green New Deal. So my name, Mark Morano, it's cut off here for some reason, but executive uh, editor, I run the website Climate Depot. Now I come from, uh, I worked in the United States Senate Environment and Public Works Committee. I worked there from 2006 to 2009. And in that job, I, I got to compile a list of 400 descending scientists, then 700 plus, and then over 1,000. And then I went on to write the book, and I have a movie called Climate Hustle, which came out a few years ago, actually 400 theaters theatrically in the US and Canada. And what, it's, it's an amazing thing, because once we put out the call through the uh, Senate Environment and Public Works Committee, we had only heard 97% of scientists, all scientists agree on the climate change issue. We started hearing from scientists on every corner of the globe. And we actually heard from former United Nations scientists who turned against the UN. So we issued these reports with the official seal of the United States Senate. And it was a shot heard around the world. The first report came out in 2007, followed with more and more names adding to it. And no longer could they claim that there were, and, and the reason that the impetus for the report of dissenting scientists on climate change was they were actually claiming that there were only a dozen scientists who rejected it, the same people people who, who believe we never landed on the moon and people who uh, are Holocaust deniers. That's where the phrase climate denier is rooted in, is a Holocaust denier. Very nasty business, but this has been an unbelievable thing. So we had Al Gore come testify and I was there uh, when Senator Inhofe from Oklahoma challenged Gore to use no more energy than the average American. Because at the time he was using 10, 20%, and then you fast forward another 10 years, he's still doing it, but he's installed solar panels on his house, which apparently made no difference because it's, this is just one of his houses. He's, it's, it's like 20 times the average American. Of course, Al Gore refused that pledge in 2007, continues to refuse it. And we'll get into that. But my talk tonight is can the Green New Deal or carbon taxes, uh, and I see there's the Citizens Climate Lobby back there promoting the free market carbon taxes, which we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, and the UN, can they control the temperature and weather? And what is the real agenda here? And how can a layperson, people always say, are you a scientist? I always like to say, and it drives them crazy, no, I'm not a scientist, but I do play one on TV occasionally. Uh, especially when I get to deb debate Bill Nye, which I've now done three times. Once on Fox News, once primetime CNN on the old Piers Corbin show. It's a lot of fun, but Bill Nye, of course, is the, the, uh, the jail, Bill Nye is the jail, the skeptic guy now, because in my interview with him, he actually is open to jailing skeptics. I asked him about RFK Jr., which we'll get to this a little bit later, because he said climate deniers are affecting his quality of life and his way of life. Bill Nye said that. But just a little background, I used to, I, I always considered myself a Republican, except when it came to environment. And I, in the 1980s, I remember not liking Reagan, President Reagan's Interior Department with Secretary James Watt. I was worried because they were, environmentalists were upset, they were putting in logging roads in the forest. And I remember thinking, oh, this is bad. I was always concerned about the uh, Amazon rainforest. Ended up doing a documentary on that in 2000. Got to make several trips down to the Amazon, where even the hardcore environmental leftist, left-wing scientists 
scientists down there were throwing down the guidebooks telling me it's BS, all the claims about the Amazon disappearing, how many football fields. And you fast forward, 2007 or 8, the New York Times finally admitted that the rainforest scare has faded away. People are moving from the jungles into the cities and the slash and burn farming, all the things they were worried about for every acre cleared, 50 are regenerating or growing. It's a huge success story. That's my book, which is actually over here. And the only difference is the new 2019 edition, you'll see the bonus chapter on the front for Green New Deal. So how did we get here? This is, um, oh, I was finishing my story real quick. So I was very concerned about the environment, but what turned me around was on the Amazon, opened my eyes. When I found out it was the most intact forest on the planet and that it was nearly 90% intact, and that the football fields a minute that were being cleared, they were double accounting. Every time they'd slash and burn, it would grow back and you couldn't distinguish uh, the forest from the previous clearing. That's how they were getting all these numbers. It was never in danger. They had stings, rainforest concert. That used to be the big environmental scare when I was growing up in the you know, 80s. And uh, that was like, you had stings, rainforest concerts every year in New York. So what happened was I investigated that, did my documentary, I had an eye opener. By the time global warming came around my radar in the mid 90s, I started looking into it, late 90s, I was already skeptical because I felt like I'd been deluded by, by I'd been conned by the environmental left with all the exaggerations. So I thought I'd start here, 1970. These are actual quotes, Paul Ehrlich. Now, Paul Ehrlich is still relative, relevant. His book, The Overpopulation Bomb, came out in the late 1960s. And it predicted all sorts of doom. Between 1980, 89, 4 billion people, 65 Americans will perish in the great die-off. I want to see a show of hands. How many of you survived the great die-off uh, between 19... <laughs> okay, so not a very good prediction there. Interestingly enough, the United Nations just released the big species report on 1 million species at risk. Who do you think was the media go-to guy? In uh, mid-80s, Paul Ehrlich, still winning awards despite being spectacularly wrong. Even the environmental left admits that the new population problem is underpopulation, that our population is going to peak and start to decline. And the whole, the whole idea of the resource scarcity proven wrong. I have old clips on my website. Johnny Carson, The Tonight Show, 1980, Paul Ehrlich predicting running out of oil within 10 years. He couldn't be more wrong, but he still couldn't be more of a media go-to guy, and he's still the go-to guy. 2006, Al Gore, humans have only 10 years left to save it, the planet from turning into a total frying pan. <laughs> Never happened. Uh, this is my favorite, uh, AOC, the world's going to end in 12 years if we don't address climate change. Just this week, she backed, that, she backed out of that prediction saying it was a dry sense of humor and people are idiots if they didn't realize she was joking. Well, if she was joking, then the United Nations who did the report last October wasn't joking, the media, the New York Times, everyone else was conned. But it does show you that even she has a limit to how she doesn't like to be ridiculed because she got more ridicule for saying we must act to save the planet. A little bit about me. I've been called a climate criminal. Uh, name one of the five criminals against humanity, against planet Earth itself. Now, interestingly enough, uh, the Rolling Stone magazine has done this, five agents of lethal delays. And I remember my, my mom was looking at all the names on it. It was like the CEO of Exxon. It was uh, uh, big corporate leaders and the people they were saying were the big planet killers. And I was on the list. And my mom, I thought she'd be all proud or upset, but she actually said to me, how come everyone else on that list is, you know, multimillionaires, but you're not? And I, and I had no good answer for her, which goes against the idea that deniers are in this for the money. So this is just this week, uh, April 30th, the last week, climate change denier. Newsweek magazine went after me because I said CO2 is not pollution. Rolling Stone magazine went after me for being on Fox News. They called me a quack about the UN species report, which we'll talk about. In Paris, 2015, the, the, this was the, remember, the UN Paris Agreement came out in 2015. This was the agreement that saved the planet. How do we know this? Because President Obama announced it. John Kerry brought his granddaughter out, his 10-year-old granddaughter, to sign uh, the agreement. This was world leaders patting themselves on the back. On the eve of that, I premiered my movie at their summit in, in, in Paris. The morning of that my movie premiere, these wanted posters of me were all around Paris, and I was wanted for being a cr criminal de climate, or a climate criminal. And this was meant to intimidate, but it actually worked because the New York Times ended up covering the opening of the premiere because of these posters were plastered. And that's really me on the streets of Paris, and it just shows you that's a puddle of urine in front of me. That's how low Paris has sunk lately. With uh, <laughs> uh, it's you know it's really 
Quite gross. Okay, so New York Times, just some of the background. Uh, even the New York, a fascinating article, New York Times said, I chewed up Bill Nye. Bill Nye debated me on CNN and with Piers Morgan, and Bill Nye repeats the same platitudes over and over. And I'm going to go through some of the just standard arguments against global warming. This was 2007, this picture. That's me and Senator Barbara Boxer of California. So I titled it Babs and Me. We took a fact-finding tour to Greenland as a part of the U.S. Senate, and I was actually selected on the committee. I, was the, 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 I got to go on the trip, a chartered plane. We had helicopters, chartered boats, the biggest carbon footprint you could imagine in order to scare global warming. Barbara Boxer actually told me on this trip, if I ever switched sides, she'd love to hire me. She, and uh, some people on the staff at the Senate put the little hearts in. Those weren't there. But that's me and Barbara Boxer in 2007. But on that trip, it was so cold that the senators had to huddle in a boat inside the boat because it was too cold to be out there as we allegedly looked at the melting uh, Greenland ice, which, by the way, peer-reviewed studies show Greenland was around the same temperature in the 1920s and late 30s up to about 1940, which shows you global warming and temperature goes in, in uh, cycles. But that was an amazing trip because... Bernie Sanders confronted me on it because I was working with Senator Inhofe on the committee and I was doing the dissenting scientists and he told me, ah, you gotta stop. You gotta, you gotta get Inhofe and all these other senators. We gotta address climate change. And, I, and, I, and my answer back to him was very simple. I said, what proposal would actually impact the climate and how do you evaluate that? And there is nothing. And he just said, ah, I'm not gonna talk to you. And he walked off and this is, as we're overlooking a fjord in an exclusive hotel after being flown there by U.S. Air Force on a huge thing, total propaganda trip, but I ended up uh, doing a whole report rebutting it. I've also been called an a-hole on live BBC TV, which I just thought was a good credential bol bolster. <laughs> Here it is, carbon dioxide. Here's the bottom line. Now, in the news today, and an AOC had their Green New Deal rally today. By the way, in Washington, it's a lot of fun right now. Uh, just check out the Drudge Report right now. Biden is fighting with AOC. The new climate deniers, and I'm not making this up, are um, Nancy Pelosi and Dianne Feinstein and Joe Biden. Why? Because they're taking the traditional Obama legislative action with climate, not the Green New Deal approach, which wants wholesale, excuse me, system change. But here's where it comes down to. Carbon dioxide is not the control knob of climate. This is one of my favorite quotes. I'm going to try to keep this presentation very layperson friendly. Climate change is governed by hundreds of factors or variables. The very idea we can manage it uh, predictably by understanding and manipulating at the margins one politically selected factor, CO2, is as misguided as it gets. And this scientist in my film went on and he said, it's scientific nonsense. So you have ocean cycles, you have solar cycles, you have methane, volcanoes, water vapor, tilt to the Earth's axis. All of these factors in land use uh, and aerosols all go together. They've tried to now tune the models, to everything, everyone to say carbon dioxide is a control knob. You'll hear now that carbon dioxide is at unprecedented levels, which we'll get to in a minute. Scientifically speaking, the Earth is in a CO2 famine. That's a quote of Dr. Will Happer, a Princeton physicist, 200 peer-reviewed papers, considered one of the world's foremost experts on the greenhouse effect. Geologic records, we've had ice ages when CO2 was 2,000 uh, parts per million higher and as high as 8,000. Temperatures have been similar when carbon dioxide was up to 20 times higher. There is no correlation in the geologic record. Now you say, how is it possible that we have unprecedented CO2. How does the news media get away with it? Well, this is a chart. There's Al Gore down at the bottom there. This is a screenshot from his movie. Look at how alarming. He's showing you CO2 levels in the past, and he's showing you temperature. What well, first thing he didn't mention is that temperature leads CO2, not the other way around. In other words, the temperature goes up, and then CO2 follows. So it's not CO2 that's driving the temperature. The second thing is he tries to scare you by showing you this projected level of CO2 and where it is today, and it looks all out of whack. And he's right about one thing. In the recent history of the Earth, we've increased the CO2 level. But here's what he left out. And this was a clip from my, and this was a, a still from my movie. That little circle down right above the word present is where... Uh, Al Gore's high point was when you look at the geologic history of the earth and this is millions of years before present so in the geologic history of the earth when we're talking ice ages and warm periods the carbon dioxide level not only was it not the control knob it followed temperature but it actually isn't even alarmingly high even under the extreme you know, model predictions at Al Gore and you can't predict future CO2 levels because you can't predict future energy technological advancements for instance who would have been able to predict that fracking 
fracking and natural gas uh, revolution would have lowered the United States emissions to we're doing better than all the uh, UN Paris Agreement signers, at least the European counterparts, our emissions are doing much better because of technological advancements. So Al Gore was frozen out. I interviewed Robert Giegengack, University of Pennsylvania, 200 peer-reviewed papers. He voted for Gore thinks he's a smart man, would vote for him again. He went and saw his first film. He was appalled. He's featured in my film, The Climate Hustle. And he just said either Gore deliberately misrepresented it or he didn't understand CO2 and the geologic record. So one of the things you'll hear over and over again, in fact, my book has a whole chapter on the 97% of scientists. This is designed so you don't have to, th it's designed for a climate activist and a politician in the media. You don't have to know a darn thing about climate. All you have to do, it's just like toothpaste. Well, is that toothpaste any good? Is that too abrasive on your teeth? What about your gut? You don't need to know anything. Four out of five dentists recommend this toothpaste. I'm going to go with that. Who are you going to be, an anti-dentist denier and not, not buy the toothpaste they recommend? That's what they've done. They've reduced climate change to 97%. And Al Gore recently on CNN about a month ago, maybe two months ago, said 99% of scientists agree. Al Gore in 1992 in his first book said nearly all scientists agree. Before we were even allowed to have a debate, they already announced that all scientists agree and came up with the 97%. Where did this number come from? How do you keep repeating it? There's multiple different ways they've come up with it. But the, one of the most famous was a study that they literally got over 10,000 scientists in a survey, whittled, tortured the data down to 77 anonymous scientists, and they said, is the earth warming? Do humans contribute? And, these sci and then from that survey, they whittled down. They said it was 97% of scientists. We don't know the names of the scientists. We don't know their academic affiliation. We don't know any of the nuances. All we know is that they whittled this down and they came out that announced it. United Nations uh, spokesman picked it up. Al Gore picked it up. The media picked it up. So anyone having a debate, it doesn't matter what kind of scientific evidence you present. They just say, oh, you're one of the 3% deniers, 97%. Who are you to disagree with it? And they say this to scientists. Another one, and this is featured in my film, a UN lead author decided to take a look at a different 90, not the 77 anonymous, a different 97%. Uh, and he said the 97% number is essentially pulled from thin air, not based on any credible research whatsoever. And he's specifically referring to a one by John Cook from Australia that, uh, that purported to look at studies claiming uh, this 97%. This is a con complete from beginning to end because one of the ways they also make the appearance of the 97% the other argument you'll hear is the National Academy of Sciences, the American Meteorological Society, all these science academies with tens of thousands, are you against all that too? How can you be against all of these scientists? Go slow. American Meteorological Society, two dozen governing board members vote on a climate statement in line with the UN. They never have a vote of their members. They never send out a survey. Most of the members aren't even aware a statement's being issued, and they're heavily dependent on government funding, this two dozen governing board members. When they actually do surveys of the meteorologists themselves, one survey found up to like 75% were skeptical or downright thought global warming was, at, you know, I think they used, some of them used the word hoax. So the actual rank and file scientists don't agree with the governing board. And then you'll hear the National Academy of Sciences, founded by President Lincoln, this esteemed body. How dare you? They've said global warming is real and human caused. And then you realize, wait a minute, the National Academy of Science is nearly and virtually 100% de de dependent on government funding. And I actually, in the book, go through all the details on this. And the former president of it got, uh, took money and they lobbied for cap and trade. They've supported carbon taxes. One scientist, Dr. Richard Lindzen of MIT, said if, if Congress and government pays the National Academy of Scientists to support climate change alarm, by golly, they, they have to do it because they've been paid to do it. This has been corrupted by this organization, and it's the same thing. Two dozen governing board members vote on these climate statements for the appearance that all scientists agree. And if you dissent, uh, one scientist in, in Washington State, Dr. Don Easterbrook, was a geologist. He went and testified before the Washington State legislator. His university got so upset, and he was attacked as a climate denier, he is now, in his 80s, retired, emeritus professor. He is banned. He told me just two weeks ago that he is banned from going on the university to give talks on geology or climate because he dared go and speak to the legislator, even though he's done peer-reviewed studies in climate, and basically say that climate change is not man-made man and not causing a climate catastrophe. That's how the university suppresses the quiet voices. 
So when you get to data, extreme weather, the most idiotic thing, you'll see all these articles of, I used to be not be a believer, but my favorite is 60 Minutes. They said uh, a young kid became a climate activist because she woke up one night and put her ankle in climate change. This, this is going to be in my sequel. What happened was it rained really hard, I believe it was Louisiana, and, and her house flooded. So she put her foot, her ankle in climate change, so she was convinced the flood was caused by climate change. So therefore, she's part of a kid's lawsuit against the government. Well, floods are not increasing. The United Nations, actually buried in the reports, agrees with this. There's no link to global warming and extreme weather. Flood disasters sharply down. Droughts are not getting worse. Global droughts are not getting worse. The United Nations, in their reports, buries this information. U.S. hurricane landfalls are down significantly even with Hurricane Harvey, Maria, recent years have seen, no, uh, have seen record low tornadoes. Big tornadoes are down since the 1950s. And one of the things you'll hear is, well, you count, there are so many more tornadoes. We're counting now. We also have much better technology. So we're counting a lot of the small tornadoes, the very mild tornadoes, but the big tornadoes, which you wouldn't need sophisticated equipment to know when they hit, the finger of God, the you know, F3, F4, they have, uh, they have actually declined. So tornadoes in, in recent years, the last five years, I mean, it's unbelievable how low the tornado levels have gone. Forest service, out in California, we have all the, all the forest, this is caused by global warming. Look at these charts. F first of all, uh, fires are not a great climate metric because there's so many other factors, water use, land use, pavement, how forestry management. But climate, no matter how you look at it, if you go back to the 1930s, much greater burns of uh, fire. Flood damage, uh, as, uh, not only is the actual occurrence of flood going down, but the actual cost and uh, proportion of GDP is significantly down. And you'll hear, there's a one in a thousand year storm. How, can we need to, how many of these storms do we need to convince people? Someone's gonna win, it's like, it's like I compare it to a lottery. Someone's gonna, if you buy a lottery ticket, someone somewhere is going to win the lottery. That's how it works. Someone somewhere is going to have a record storm or a one in a hundred year flood or one in 500 year flood, which is actually just an insurance metric. It doesn't mean the weather is getting more extreme. It just means the media is hyping completely normal occurrences because once you compile all the data, there are no trends, either no trend or declining trends. These are drought conditions for the United States as of, uh, this is a 2016 study. It's just not there. California, well, California, this is the man caused drought, Governor Jerry Brown. This was actually surprising. The, the Mercury News 2014 had a great article quoting scientists. One of the very few times I was really impressed with this article. Past dry periods have lasted more than 200 years in California. California has been parched for much longer stretches in the 163 year historical uh, period. This is incredible because it just goes, in, once you have perspective, but then you say, how is that possible? How does the media get away with saying, you know, you know drought is up sharply? It's all about your timelines. If you start a timeline in 2000, 2000, 2005, 2010, and you say, if this trend continues, you can make anything look alarming. One of the biggest cons is these, it's a group that gets TV weathermen to, to promote climate fairs. And they go, look at this, since 1970, this temperature has gone up this much. If this continues, blah, blah, blah. Why do they pick 1970? All these TV weathermen that's being funded, uh, it's actually out of my old alma mater, George Mason University, they pick one of the coldest years. 1970s were the global cooling ice age scare. They pick a very cold year and they show you how much the temperature's gone up. Had they picked, say, the 1930s, they wouldn't be able to make that claim. It's all about your time frame. And if you go back to the medieval warm period, it was as warm or warmer than today. If you go back to zero AD, the Roman warming period, probably significantly warmer, or at least uh, more convincing that it was warmer than today. This is all without, you know, Al Gore's jet travel or uh, uh, you know, cold plants or natural gas. On terms of hurricanes, I love this chart. These are, this is the chart that shows landfalling hurricanes over the U.S., including Irma, including the really bad year. As CO2 has risen, they've actually declined. Now, it doesn't mean more CO2 means less hurricanes necessarily, because correlation isn't necessarily causation, but it just gives you an idea. They want you to believe that th there's a group called 350.org that wants to roll back the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere, which by the way, carbon dioxide, trace essential gas, we inhale oxygen, we exhale carbon dioxide, that's now been declared a pollutant by the EPA under the Endangerment Act and the Supreme Court has backed it up. Uh, but this is it, so as CO2 goes up, no increase. So low CO2 storms is what I like to call them. Actually, a guy named Tony Heller who runs the Real Science uh, website has a great, finding all the old articles of all the extreme weather that, that happened in the past. No matter what people claim, unprecedented storm, you can 
we can go back in the record peer reviewed journal and show you that low CO2 storms were not only probably worse because weather was worse back then, but also more deadly because we weren't as resilient. We didn't have as much spreading of fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are the greatest way to prevent yourself from, to pr protect yourself from extreme weather. Global hurricane frequency update as of last year, 12 run. Again, you can see that there's either no trend or declining trends on all of this. This is global too. I'm not cherry picking. These are the tornado charts. You see how the 1970s has been a decline in the EF3 and stronger tornadoes. Now we get into, they claim, when President Obama did his uh, EPA climate regulations, he had John Podesta go on TV, it was the Weather Channel, and he said, we need these cl clean power plan and we need the EPA climate regulations because the storms are getting worse. And it was a shocking thing to say, the storms, so wait a minute, Obama's climate regulations are going to make storms better? Is that what you're saying? And they wouldn't even impact global CO2 levels, let alone theoretically climate or storms. So one of my favorite quotes, and this was when they featured in my original um, 400 dissenting scientists. This is uh, Hendrik Tenekis, who is the Royal Meteorological Society in the uh, Netherlands. The doomsday predictor of Al Gore painted uh, 15 times the IPCC number of sea level rise is entirely without merit. And this next line is key. I protest vigorously the idea that climate reacts like a home heating system to a change setting of the thermostat. Turn the dial and the desired temperature will soon be reached. Because that's how the Green New Deal is being praised. That's how the United Nations, we need to keep the Earth 1.5, deg 2 degrees Celsius for warming. No, 1.5, let's be aggressive. At the 2007, uh, I think it was 2007 or 8, United Nations Climate Conference, you had European leaders arguing. It was Tony Blair at the time, and I, I don't know if it was Andrea Merkel. They were arguing, I will keep temperatures 2 degrees. I'll, I'll up yours. I'll do 1.5. Arguing about how, as politicians today, they're going to affect the temperature of the Earth 100 years from now. <laughs> Completely bonkers. Now, polar bears. This was the poster child of climate change. Let me ask a question. Do you guys feel like you haven't heard as much about polar bears as say you did 10 years ago? Very good. They are no longer the climate change, not ICOR, but ICON. Fat, healthy polar bears have prompted Gore. Let me ask you a question. How many times do you think Gore, his first movie made polar bears the icon? It was the, it was the number one issue. How many times in his sequel that came out in 2015, 2017, how many times do you think Al Gore mentioned polar bears? Let me see. How many times do you think, do you think it was three times or less? Five times or more? Give me a guess. How many times? Zero. His book, zero. Why did Al Gore abandon polar bears? Because they are at or near historic population highs. They've never counted this many polar bears. But hold on. We're, we're, sa <laughs> we're still safe. They still haven't given defeat. You know how they... All right, that's a little low class, but it had to make the point. The reason, the reason they haven't given up the game completely is because the media will still say it's worse than we thought for polar bears. How can they say that? At or near historic population, there's more polar bears than they've ever counted. Because their predictions now of 50 to 100 years are more dire than they were just five or 10 years ago. It's a classic misdirection. Global temperatures uh, have basically declined since the high point of the El Nino in 2016. We're going on about oh, over three years now of a global cooling trend. The media is ignoring it by saying, New studies predict accelerating global warming five to ten years in the future. So that's that misdirection. When current reality fails to alarm, make scarier and scarier predictions of the future. And that's what they're doing with polar, bear, polar bears when they talk about them at all. Antarctica. This is now going to be a new 2019 study. They're updating it, basically finding the same thing. Not currently contributing to sea level rise, actually contributing to a sea level lowering, which is a phenomenal thing to be happening. And this is according to NASA scientists and a study funded by NASA. This is a huge deal because Al Gore needs Greenland and uh, Antarctica to start melting so his Florida underwater can look realistic. 1939, Greenland glaciers melting, says scientists. It may be without exaggeration, it may be without exaggeration, the glaciers like those in Norway and possibly of a catastrophic collapse. We've heard this before, catastrophic collapse of Greenland. Guess what happened after this? We went through a global cooling phase and Greenland glaciers, no talk about it again until about the 1990s when there was a warming trend back up there again. Now, you might say, well, the world's top scientists, in fact, Greta Thunberg, a 16-year-old girl who, who's got autism and she's heavily funded uh, by international organizations. She was chosen. Her parents are very well connected. She's leading these school strikes. 
And what she does is she goes on TV on every Friday, she skips school, and she says, and her exact quote is, why should children go to school when there will be a future that will be no more because the politicians won't act? She's from Sweden. And it's, they're calling it the cult of Greta. But here's what she's basing it on, the UN scientists. These are the prestige, John Kerry, this is the gold standard of science. Uh, no, uh, Senator Kerry, it's fool's gold. The UN IPCC, founded in 1988, their climate panel, purely a political body posing as a scientific institution. They won the Nobel Prize, right? This is the prestigious. They won the Nobel Peace Prize for political activism. The head of the UN uh, report was Rajendra Pachari, and he said, global warming is my religion, the head of the scientific panel. In 2018, Gore shocked the world. He admitted in an interview that the UN reports are, quote, torqued up to promote political action. How else did the UN get the attention of policymakers around the world? So these reports that come out of the United Nations, they have to be agreed line by line by politicians, bureaucrats, uh, by the summary for policymakers, and the scientists have to go back and make the underlying report reflect the policy. We've had UN uh, chairman actually come out and say, wait till the next report, years ahead of time, it'll be so alarming the world will have to act. And the climate gate scandal showed us that the UN was running basically a campaign effort, a campaign cause. It was a narrative. So the UN top echelon of scientists were not allowing dissent. They were threatening journal editors. They were lamenting that solar scientists weren't agreeing with them. And they were excluding studies and scientists who didn't toe the line because they had a narrative they had to keep. In 1988, the United Nations put itself in charge of finding carbon dioxide was dangerous to the planet. If it found any other conclusion, it failed to have a reason to exist. And not only did they get to find that, but they then get to set up, put themselves in charge of a solution. So they get to identify the problem, torque it up, as Al Gore says, suppress dissent, threaten journal editors, not allow uh, any dissenting uh, views, and then they get to come up with the solution, UN Paris agreements, global governance. Controlling carbon is a bureaucrat's dream. If you control carbon, you control life. And sorry for some of the formatting on this mess up. This is MIT scientist Richard Lindzen. Think about that. We exhale carbon dioxide from our mouth. Controlling carbon is a bureaucrat's dream. If you control it, you control life. That's what we're talking about here. That is underlying this. And I'll get into this. When I talk about the Green New Deal, all we find out is the climate scare is the latest environmental scare with the exact same solutions. That's what my bonus chapter is about in the book. I go back, whether it's overpopulation, the resource scarcity, deforestation, they always had the same solutions. And what are those solutions? Right now, in 2009, the New York Times columnist Tom Friedman, on the pages of the paper, he lauded China's one-party rule for the environmental policies. Quote, one party can impose politically difficult but critically important policies needed to move a society forward. To hell with democracy! We need one party! He even got criticized by some on the left for this, but this was in the pages of the New York Times. What is the United Nations? This is the, the vice, the co-chair of Working Group 3, in an interview, the IPCC will redistribute the world's wealth by climate policy. One has to free oneself from the illusion that international climate policy is environmental policy. This has almost nothing to do with environmental policy anymore. That's the United Nations, one of the leaders, admitting this in an interview. So if people who say, well, the United Nations is just what possible reason could they have? Possible reason. They get to have the conferences every year. They get to hype the problem or torque it up in Al Gore's word. And then they get to come up with a solution, which they admit has nothing to do with the climate. In other words, if we face the climate catastrophe, don't expect the UN policies to have any saving grace. So we'll get into that a little later. Connie Hedegaard, the EU climate commissioner, I actually went to Greenland with her on the trip with Senator Boxer and Bernie Sanders. Let's say the science some decades from now says we were wrong about climate change. It's not about it. Would it not in any case have been good to do many of the things we are proposing in order to combat climate change? This is a shocking statement because she's basically saying, yeah, if we're wrong, you know, we don't need the UN, we don't need the UN treaties, we don't need the EPA regs, we don't need the Green New Deal. That's fine, if that's what you really think, but why not sell the policies on their merits? Why use a, a hyped up or torqued up, in Al Gore's words, climate scare in order to get this done? This just goes to show you the science is irrelevant. They want these policies. And we have people calling capitalism versus the climate. 
This is George Mambiant, UK environmentalist. This is just in April 2009. We've got to go straight to the heart of capitalism and overthrow it. He's talking specifically about how to solve global warming. They're not, if you actually just uncover the veneer, they are openly very clear about what they want to do. And this is what the Green New Deal is all about. They want system change and social justice, climate justice, mining, all these different phrases they do. But they don't want to argue the policies without a climate scare, without deadlines, without urgency, because they know they can't convince enough people that way. Now, I'm going to give you an update on the state of climate science. One of the things you'll hear is the climate models do so well. We know very well what's been going on with the climate. Things are very uh, obvious now, and that we are more certain than ever. John Kerry will say this is as settled as gravity. This is uh, high school, basic high school physics. Well, if you want to be like the same thing with, uh, say you're playing, betting on the Super Bowl, bet on both teams to win, and you can tell everyone on Monday morning, hey, I predicted it, I won, Can't pay me, I predict. But here's the problem, here we go. Climate change, this is the state of climate science as it, as, as, as it were. Climate change means less snow. Snowfalls are a thing of the past. Climate change means more snow. Now, they said it means less snow back in 2000 when we had a period of low snow. Michael Oppenheimer, UN lead scientist, I bought my daughter a sled and now she won't be able to use it because of global warming. In the pages of the New York Times. Then we have record snow. East Coast, snowiest decade on record by like 2013. We had more snow on the East Coast, broke all records. So what happens? Well, global warming means more snow, of course. Who would, uh, we, uh, we told you it was extreme weather. Climate change means the days are getting longer. Wow, so we're going to have longer days. That's pretty intense. Climate change is causing it. But wait a minute. Global warming will make the earth spin faster, which will make the day reducing the length of a day. See down at the bottom here. So wait, so the day is longer, it's shorter. Climate change makes wet places wetter and dry places drier, except when it makes wet places drier. And this, <laughs> and dry places wetter. Antarctic ice is melting so fast, the continent may be at risk by 2100. Antarctic is actually gaining ice, but global warming ain't over. So global, it's, it's, it's losing and gaining. Now get this, this is really sad. Climate change, our SUVs, our coal plants, gas, it's going to dull the leaves. We're gonna, we're gonna, it's going to ruin uh, going out and looking at the beautiful leaves. Oh, wait a minute. These, fat, these real colors are causing more colorful leaves, according to another study. You can have it both ways. Climate change makes for saltier seas. Climate change makes for less salty seas. Climate change will increase the spread of malaria. Climate change means global warming wilts malaria. It means there will be less malaria now. 2015 claimed deng outbreaks increase with climate change. 2016 claimed climate change could reduce the desk then climate risk. Do you see what's going on here? No matter what happens, they can come out and say, we predicted it. Our models are correct. We were right. Climate change causes less rain. Climate change causes more rain. I like this, but less water. I, I don't even want to try to figure that one out. <laughs> climate change causes more lightning. Uh, I'm sorry. Le uh, climate change claims could drop 15% as climate change causes global temperature to soar. So lightning strikes, that actually should be less lightning there. And then this one, we'll see more lightning. So you have climate change causes less lightning, climate change causes more lightning. Climate change makes San Francisco foggier. It's pretty, get ready for foggier summers. But wait a minute, fog over San Francisco thins by a third due to climate change. So how about that? So whether you have more fog or less fog, guess what? They predicted it. Climate change causes more hurricanes. Climate change causes less hurricanes. There'll be fewer but more powerful hurricanes. And every time they come up with a new theory, they're just so certain that it's right. Climate change will increase. This is brand new. This was uh, actually just from this month. Climate change will both increase and decrease fertility. So there you go. Whether the population goes up or down, whatever. Just, at this point, they should just say, whatever happens, we're going to claim it. Why we wouldn't waste the study? Climate change will bring more crime. Now, these were UN lead author scientists doing silly studies about vehicle car thefts. Climate change will become one of the major forces driving crime as the century progresses. It will be but wait, this is actually in the hollowed pages of the New York Times. 2016, lowering crime could contribute to global warming. I'm confused. Global warming is going to cause more crime, but lowering crime causes more global warming? I can't follow this. But don't worry, New York Times will explain it. Inmates consume less than the average citizen. So fewer prisoners will mean overall uh, uh, higher, energy higher energy consumption. So if you have less people in prison, in other words, prison is a low carbon lifestyle that we should all be uh, aspiring to. The money saved from reducing crime can be spent in other ways, infrastructure, and this is where we are. So 
Global warming causes more crime. Reducing crime causes more global warming. And if you disagree with any of it, you are a climate denier and belong in jail. Now, who said that? Oh, wait a minute. Bill Nye, the jail the skeptics guy, said that. He entertains the idea of jailing climate skeptics for affecting his quality of life. And that's what he said. Now, it's an amazing thing. He was, he was responding. He was responding to Robert F. Kennedy Jr. saying that we belong at the Hague with three uh, square meals and a cot, all the climate deniers. So this is where we are right now. Whether the ice caps melt or expand, whatever happened, the climate activists theorize it confirms their theory. This is no longer science. This is no longer falsifiable science. He called this is a scientist who compared it to a pseudoscience like astrology. It is obvious anthropogenic global warming is not a science at all. I am, again, political, government, politics background, not a scientist. It's the perfect background to analyze global warming claims. Now, they weren't finished with all that. Global warming causing women to become hookers in Africa. <laughs> women are turning to prostitution because they can't make money due to farming. So if there's bad weather in Africa and women become desperate, this is sad. They're blaming it on global warming. The United Nations is, is, is been, got involved in this. Climate change pushes poor women to prostitution. So in other words, you driving an SUV is causing people to become hookers in Africa and other parts of the world. It's just, it's, it's completely scientifically invalid. I use this example, 1933, no joke. In Syria, the yo-yo was banned. Why was it banned? Because they thought that yo-yo was causing drought. The government in Syria, the Muslim government in Syria, 1933, this is uh, January 23rd, banned the yo-yo because they thought it was causing drought. And this is, uh, th and I say that's as scientifically valid as believing that all these other things are caused or not caused by global warming. This is interesting, a UK high government official the global warming policy we've already passed may have slowed down global warming. This was when we had the global warming pause going on before they went and re-altered the data. We had a, going on almost 20 years of no temperature increase. And then the government, right before the UN Paris Agreement at NOAA, a National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, rushed a paper through days before the UN Paris Agreement in 2015. And they announced the global warming temperature standstill has been erased. We went back and redid the numbers. And guess what? There never was a pause, despite them having over 60 excuses for the global warming temperature pause. Suddenly, they changed all the numbers. If you had a company losing money for two decades and you hire an accountant and they say, guess what? You made record profits now. Forget about all that other stuff. No one would buy it. But this happened in the United States government. And this worked because it was a huge media bonanza. But now they're claiming that these green energy policies are already. So now if we have a year of low tornadoes or no bad hurricanes, they're going to claim, hey, look, our you know, carbon tax or our Green New Deal or our EPA regulations, they're already having a positive impact. Because now no matter what happens, they've already predicted both outcomes. It may have slowed down. And this is absurd, by the way, because emissions keep going up. So that's why I'm saying, what are you smoking? This is what people believe. Now, will it cause us to eat each other? You all know Ted Turner, the founder of CNN. By the year 2040, civilization will be broken down. The few people left will be in a failed state like Somalia or the Sudan. Now, coming from the East Coast, when I look at California, I often think of California like a failed state like Somalia or Sudan politically. So has anyone resorted to cannibalism here? He says most of the people will have died and the rest of us will be cannibals. Now you think, okay, this is Ted Turner. It's just a wacky thing. He says things. My mom makes this big deal about it. Not. This is not just Ted Turner. Paul Ehrlich, this is 2014, climate change will force humans to eat the bodies of the dead. This is their environmental hero. He was just on CNN last week hyping this uh, species report. Uh, humans will need to drastically change our eating habits and agriculture. By the way, the former United Nations climate chief has proposing that we treat meat eaters the same way smokers are treated in restaurants. Put them out back, give them their own section. They want to shame meat eating because cow emissions uh, from burping, belching, and the other end are allegedly more damaging to climate change than you know, all the transportation sector combined, according to the United Nations. So, climate activists, skeptics are condemned to hell. This was in the pages of the New York Times to Paul Krugman. Those who deny global warming, quote, may you be punished in the afterlife for doing so. He calls denial an almost inconceivable sin. Now, who said the New York Times was secular? This sounds pretty religious, sounds like a pretty fundamentalist uh, religious paper here. Did someone say afterlife? Uh, if you think that you can escape global warming, oh, hold on one sec here. If you think you can escape global warming when you die, think again. Siberian corpses could ooge contagious virus if the graves thaw out. So even when you die, they won't leave you alone. 
Can a carbon tax save the mummies? Climate change causes mummies to turn to black ooze. This is in uh, Argentina, I believe. The burial sites are experiencing higher humidity levels due to climate change. This is a peace professor, Michael Clare. This is where you send your kids off to college. This is some of the stuff they're being taught. This was in Salon Magazine. This professor wrote it. If the earth continues to heat at its exponential rate, our post-apocalyptic fantasies could become everyday realities. I'm going to go ahead and read this because this is our millennial generation. This is what they're exposed to. Here we go. We envision rising temperatures, prolonged drought, freakish storms, hellish wildfires, rising sea levels, food rights, mass starvation, state collapse, mass migrations, conflicts of every sort up to and including full scale war could prove even more disruptive and deadly position. Drought and hunger will force millions of people to abandon their traditional lands and flee to the squalor of shanty towns. <laughs> That's what they're being taught. That sounds like the book of Revelations. I don't even know what this is. This is what college kids are being exposed to at major universities here. And again, what are they smoking? I think we have an idea, actually, especially if we're talking Colorado and other places. Okay. Chris Wallace got Al Gore to admit something on Fox News. This was fascinating in, uh, two years ago that even if all nations agree, this is after the hype of the UN Paris Agreement, it wouldn't solve the problem. It, but Al Gore admitted that the UN Paris Agreement, which was supposed to be the savior of our planet, actually just is meant to send a signal to industry. And it actually wouldn't do anything. So I, I'm actually working on a report, all the quotes from 2015. We've saved the planet. We've come together. This is a historic moment. Now everyone's saying the planet's doomed and they need more. They're not happy. Not only do they need more, another climate treaty on top of the UN Paris and they need ratcheting up commitments, they want the species to come out. And the species report, uh, they have like a, a few thousand species that are legitimately apparently at risk, but they extrapolate that to a million. And it's mostly habitat loss, which we have great success now with you know, re recovering species. But they're actually calling in this new UN report for massive transformation of society. They just want as many layers covered. And they had such success with the IPCC. Why not with the climate issue? Why not just expand the species? The UN has, yeah, has no real pushback, particularly in the United States, from people who should be pushing back, other than President Trump himself. There's not no one uh, in Congress, Senate, very few senators or congressmen, I mean, a small amount will actually push back on scientifically. This is one of my favorite quotes. This is the man who voted for Al Gore and was appalled at his film. But he said, none of the strategies that have been offered by the U.S. government or by the EPA or anyone else has the remotest chance of altering the climate if, in fact, the climate is controlled by CO2. So in other words, even if you believe Al Gore, even if you believe every word the United Nations said and Paul Ehrlich has said and Michael Mann has said and all these other none of this would make a difference because they wouldn't even, the Green New Deal won't even affect global emissions. The UN climate uh, report, there, it, it, the temperature, if you believe the UN models and according to the UN, you won't even be able to notice a temperature difference 100 years from now. That's not saying there will be a temperature difference. That's if you believe what they're claiming. They know that, but they just want to get every step. So everything they claim when they have a historic agreement, it's always followed by, we need more, this was not enough, and that's where we are now. I interviewed Christina Figueres, she's the former UN climate chief. She quote, seeks a centralized transformation, uh, a very different transformation, one that's going to make life on planet Earth very different. That is what the United Nations is trying to do. That's the UN climate chief at the time. I've interviewed her actually after this. She laughed off suggestions. I was talking, asking her about global governance and what their agenda is. Centralized transformation. So if anyone has any doubts, and they've already said we'll redistribute wealth by climate policy, and global warming is the religion, as the other climate chief said, the Green New Deal, that's the AOC, the Green New Deal, insane, unscientific, medi medieval rituals. Right now in New York City, they're banning hot dogs, processed meat to improve the climate. Part of the city's Green New Deal. In fact, Mayor de Blasio is now fining Trump's buildings like $2.2 million. They're using New York City's Green New Deal as a political weapon because they're mad at Donald Trump, so they're going after him. Physicist Dr. Lubus Model, former Harvard physicist, calls New York City's inspired ban insane, unscientific, medieval ritual. And we'll get back to that medieval ritual, but that's where we've come to. And in my sequel, I'm coming out with a sequel, Climate Hustle 2, it'll be out early next year as our plan, feature a whole segment on this. This is actually a movement to shrink human beings through genetic engineering. NYU professor, not, you know, this isn't just some crackpot activist. Well, he is a crackpot, but he's not, you know, he's actually pretty significant in the movement. Human engineering can combat climate change. Genetic engineering to make people smaller, you become less resource intensive. Matthew Lau, he's looking for pharmacological enhancement of altruism and empathy. You don't care about global warming? We're gonna medicate you until you do. 
Uh, you'll add, you'll, you want you to, they want you to adopt the necessary behavioral and market solutions for curbing climate. You don't support a carbon tax? We will medicate you until you do. We will shrink you. They're, they're, this is a serious movement. So then you'll hear like these global warming. I have a whole chapter, actually a bonus chapter in the book on my web on global warming actually reduces conflict. It's during the warmer times that there's less conflict in wars, colder times where you have more crop failure and resource scarcity causes more war. And these are peer-reviewed studies. But interestingly enough, back in the 1970s during the global cooling scare, they were blaming war and terrorism on global cooling. Now it's warming, they're blaming it on global warming. Uh, I had some fun in the first film. I found 1970s clips, multiple clips from ABC News using the lowly armadillo uh, from Texas, Oklahoma, as a climate change mascot. It was our, that era's uh, polar bear. And it said the, the, the armadillo was migrating south to get away from the encroaching cold because it needed warmer air to survive. Fast forward 30 years, same network, ABC News. Guess what? The armadillo, they have the same thing. And this time, the armadillo, because of dangerous global warming, has to migrate north in order to get out of the heat. So the, uh, uh, the only animal we could find, a global warming mascot, both for global cooling and warming by the same network. This is interesting. 1941, scientists claim global warming created Hitler. No joke. Warmer temperatures may have produced a trend toward dictatorial governments. People are more docile and easily led in warm weather. Now, if politicians in California get this, you're going to start having elections. What's your hottest month here? Uh, is it August, July? They're going to move all the elections then because you'll be more docile and willing to vote for them in. Links fascism with the weather. This is actually true. This was a doc, uh, professor, Clarence Mills, professor, University of Cincinnati. The rise of Adolf Hitler in Germany and Benito Mussolini may have in part due to a gradually warming temperature of the world. So it's not just our current age that said stupid things, but they said it here. But did global warming save Hitler? Now, I did some research on this. You know, just much like global warming causes crime and reducing crime causes more global warming, we may have created Hitler with global warming, but did global warming save Hitler? And if you find out, I don't know if you can actually read this, but the day that von Stauffenberg tried to uh, assassinate uh, Adolf Hitler with the bomb, they had to move the room the last day because the temperature was so warm in the 1940s that day that they moved it to a room with a big heavy table and the bomb they put in didn't end up, uh, it ended up just wounding Hitler and not killing him. So in 1908, right now we have the Green New Deal, which I'll talk, touch on in a minute here. 1908, fossil fuels accounted for 85% of U.S. energy consumption. 2015, more or less the same. Now look at this. This is 1908, 85% comes from fossil fuels in, in 2015, same scenario. Ocasio-Cortez is claiming that 12 years we need to basically change 100 years of history, physics, technology. Uh, and turn everything around to make it all solar and wind power. This is, this is an incredible thing because it just realizes that you know, we can change through technological advancement, but it's not going to come from central planning. In other words, if solar and wind, I'm not going to say anything bad about them right now, but if, if they are that viable, Al Gore says it's entrepreneur technology, they're doubling, tripling, if they're that great, why do you need to ban the competition? Why do you need to ban uh, coal, oil, gas? The, one of the, great, the greatest liberators of mankind in the history of our planet. That's what they're trying to do here. Al Gore, when I went to Australia, actually praised global warming. I actually presented Al Gore with a copy of my film DVD, and he just kept walking and went off to his waiting SUV, and the lady with him made like a, uh, she did like a gasp face that I was presenting him with the skeptical film. But Al Gore even said, we've had tremendous benefits from the reliance on fossil fuels. We know he has poverty has declined, living standards have increased, and we still depend on them for more than 80% of the world's energy. This is just 2017. So even Al Gore recognizes this. So let it play out. If you can go to Walmart and buy a solar panel one day and get off the grid, hey, you don't need a Green New Deal if that's what it is. And I always tell people, spending money is not controversial in Washington. Washington loves to spend money. They're going to keep sub subsidizing spending money on all kinds of renewable energy boondoggles. If the next pre Democrats win, they're talking about a uh, green energy stimulus that'll make Obama's look ridiculously small. Obama's was like 80 billion or something. They're talking about like a trillion dollars or two trillion. Some of the Democrats are proposing these green energy stimulus. You're going to have unbelievable money flowing. And as they try to ban, uh, again, energy that's proven itself. Now, what else, the other, other agenda? This is fascinating because this is really gets you thinking of the Green New Deal. At all these UN conferences I go to, and I've been to Bali, Cancun, I'm going to Santiago, Chile later this year. Hey, 
you can knock it. It's a great thing. They, they know how to party. They know how to pick exotic locations. Uh, when I was in the U.S. Senate, they flew all the staffers to these U.N. conferences. I would be in this, the fold-down pods in the bed, $16,000 State Department paid round-trip ticket per staffers. And we stayed at a, literally a five-star oceanfront resort in Bali with luau's every night and uh, you know all-you-can-eat buffets. This is how the United Nations does their climate conferences. But at these conferences, this is what they talk about. Uh, I met Kevin Anderson, who's from the UK. He's actually cut back on his showering, and he's advocating planned recessions. So this is what the United Nations is being presented with. This is what they talk about at these summits. Nations should give up the growth obsession. Another professor here, this was, I think, a TED Talk. She calls for planned recessions to fight global warming. Economic growth needs to be exchanged for planned austerity. Whole system change. Now think about it. What's AOC talking about? She's, the Green New Deal is nothing but a massive planned recession. They don't want to use that phrase, but that's what we're talking about here. Rex Murphy, a Canadian National Post, the Green New Deal will turn America into Venezuela. It uses environmentalism as a lever to pursue, pursue a far larger, more sinister agenda, a mad leap to a socialist nightmare, night world. This is just fun. Every Earth Hour, which is, I don't even remember the date, people do the car, they call it the carbon belts to protest Earth Hour. You go put on all your lights and idle your vehicle for the hour. But this is Earth Hour, which is supposed to essentially turn your back on uh, uh, electricity to say, okay, this is, let's respect the Earth and turn all the lights off. North Korea is a classic example of central planning, one party rule, planned recession, all the things we're supposed to uh, you know, value here. That's a satellite picture. You see Seoul, South Korea, all the lights. Look at North Korea. That's how uh, dark it is and how undeveloped. That's what happens uh, when you have an 80 year, well, well, what was the Korean War? Ended 1953, so I can't do my math. That's 70 years since the Korean War. That is what happens when you have planned recessions in a you know, Green New Deal type central planning, which the UN is advocating. Our future in the UK, Europe is much more advanced. People always say, oh, look, Europe, we're only, Europe is much more advanced. Yeah, they are. In England, their power chief is warning Brits that the era of constant electricity is ending. Families will have to get used to power only when it's available. That's the future. Planned recessions, energy restrictions, skyrocketing costs. Senior citizens have much higher death rates as the energy costs go in from all the green energy mandates. And that's where the Green New Deal is taking us. The era of constant electricity is ending. The days of permanently available may be coming to an end, the head of the power. We are going to change our behavior and consume it only when it's available and available cheaply. This is where they are in Europe. This is where we're headed under this. Now, if you remember Gilligan's Island, I love the end title. It had actually had the song. No food, no lights, no motor cars, not a single luxury. This is what the Green New Deal is right now. They're, they're, Democrats had a big conference in Washington right now. And what's interesting is they're going after Joe Biden now for, for being a denier. You know, I mentioned all, AOC is... Uh, is the rock star of the Democratic Party right now. She is setting the policy. And this is a very serious note. I'm going I'm to have to wind this up here. She is setting the agenda so that any Democrat who wins has to have the litmus test of supporting the Green New Deal, which no one even knows really all the details of it. But it's like Nancy Pelosi with Obamacare. We have to pass it first before we know what's in it. That's basically what's going to happen. If President Trump loses re-election in 2020, we are getting a Green New Deal. We are getting back in the UN Paris Agreement. We are getting all the EPA climate. This is such a temporary blip. It's, uh, President Trump has been the greatest president and friend of science you could ever imagine that we've had blows away George, just a little quick history here. George H.W. Bush got us in the Rio Earth Summit, which led to the whole UN climate process. Uh, George W. Bush rubber stamped every UN report and continued the funding and sent you know, delegations and supported it all. Uh, and John McCain, the nominee, was actually a co-sponsor of climate bills. Mitt Romney had all of Obama's, had Obama's EPA staff before they went to Obama, and he urged President Trump to stay in the UN Paris Agreement. Donald Trump stands alone among Republicans, at least since Reagan, to willing to stand up to this whole Green New Deal and whole climate change agenda. And he's, I love his comment that it's a, a, you know, a hoax invented by the Chinese. He was joking when he said it. But China will certainly benefit. And by the way, I, I know people here are advocating the carbon tax. I have a whole separate presentation that actually says if you care about emissions, 
Carbon taxes ultimately raise global emissions, period. Why? Because you're going to raise the cost of energy in developed worlds where you impose it, and all that's going to do is outsource to places like China, India, South America, where they don't have all the technological, technological advancements. So you're going to end up perversely increasing the emissions, so it's the exact opposite of what you intended. And don't be fooled by a carbon tax. Giving the government a vast new taxing authority, which they claim will be revenue neutral and free market, for what, one year it'll be revenue neutral? Once they have that authority, they're never giving it up. That'll keep going up, just like the UN agreements. The UN Paris Agreement, we saved the planet. Actually, now we need to ratchet it up. We need to have, continue these meetings. We need more uh, treaties and studies. This was the study done actually using EPA climate models that would have no effect on climate, uh, barely distinguishable from zero. That's a study that just came out last month. Now, I'll leave on a positive note. Trump is set to set. Is set to set up a science panel headed by Dr. Will Happer. I mentioned him earlier. Actually, who is Will Happer? One of my favorite quotes. This is Trump's science advisor who may head this climate panel. 2017, I don't see a whole bunch of difference between the consensus on climate change and the consensus on witches. <laughs> at the witch trials in Salem, the judges were educated at Harvard. This was supposedly 100% science. The one, the one or two people who said there were no witches were immediately hung. Not much has changed. That is the man who could upend the entire climate debate. Just so you understand, when the CO2 is considered a toxic pollutant, the Supreme Court had to rule, because of the, the weak Republican presidents, the two Bushes, I should just say, and because of Obama and Clinton, all the federal judges have to go by is we have the UN science is accepted by the United States, even though it violates the basic principles of science because they're, they're politically interfered with by, other, by the politicians and bureaucrats. And we have the National Climate Assessment. You may remember that. Trump's own scientists disagree with him. No, the National Climate Assessment was a federal report that's been mandated since the Clinton administration. It was written by Obama's former lead negotiator for the UN Paris Agreement. And the lead authors were activists with the left-wing environmental group, the Union of Concerned Scientists. So it came out last, I think, November. If it read like a uh, left-wing environmental press release, that's because it was. And it was. But they had the stamp of the government. That's where Trump needs to do more on that. But essentially, any judge looks at that and they're going to end up ruling in favor of kids' climate activists. There's a very big danger. So this science panel will be independent outside experts coming in, led by Will Happer, Princeton physicist, considered one of the most foremost experts. And this could be the first time in the entire climate debate that we'll have a United States government seal of approval, federal report, pushing back on the United Nations, the National Climate Assessment, and then judges, federal rulings, lawsuits, we would have something that we could actually uh, turn around and fight this. So the number one thing, if someone asks what you can do about climate change, is urge this panel to be set up this year and get this report out because we need the guy who accurately pr uh, predict, uh, can uh, analogize that global warming has become essentially like medieval witchcraft. We never had weather like this till those witches came along. The crops never failed. Now now they're blaming our SUVs and coal plants, and no matter what happens, they can claim they predicted it. So with that, uh, I just want to say you can sign up for Climate Depot updates on my website, climatedepot.com. I have my book. There's a movie you can actually watch it on Amazon, uh, uh, Amazon Prime. You can watch it easily enough and a couple other places. You go to my website. My parent organization's Committee for Constructive Tomorrow. We call ourselves a free market environmental group. Global warming is the greatest threat to liberty we've ever faced. Not the actual science of it, but the solutions. And the Green New Deal is actually a gift for us because we see that they're not even pretending anymore. It's about the environment or science or actually affecting change. They just want to scare people. 12 years, we must act, no time, so we make a rushed, bad decision. But we need to push back hard on the science, and I'm hoping this presidential commission does that. That's my contact information, Moreno at Climate Depot, and that's my Twitter and all that. So thank you very much, and I guess to Q&A now, I guess. The first one's kind of interesting, and it's multiple choice. Okay. So the question says, you know, you know, what is the solution to climate change? And the options were tax, spend, which of course are related, or to regulate. And I, I think in this answer, you may want to also say, well, of all we heard, is there something that needs to be, do we need a solution? Or is climate change? No, I, actually, my favorite um, line in the entire climate change debate was Lord Christopher Monckton, a former uh, science advisor to Margaret Thatcher, who testified on Capitol Hill 2009, back when we had the cap and trade bill. 
And he actually said, when confronted with he had a British accent, when confronted with the non-problem of global warming, we must have the courage to do nothing. Yeah. And I love that quote. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean you don't have environmental protections. There's a big, obviously a huge difference between clean air, clean water. But just keep in mind, since 1970, we've had radical improvements in population, economic growth, and radical cleanup in rivers and water and air. Technology and economic growth go hand in hand. More fossil fuels in the developing world will clean up the environment. One of the greatest threats they face is lack of chlorinated water, lack of infrastructure, breathing in, in huts made of dung, all the bad air. So the solution is to basically continue what we're doing. Hey, let solar, wind, there's no solution, but the way forward is to just let it go. We don't know what the energy mix is. We don't know what kind of uh, technological advancements are coming, but fossil fuels are getting cleaner on the stuff that really matters, the real pollutants, but not CO2. But even CO2 is lowering just through technological breakthroughs. Great, great. Well, we have a couple that are kind of related. Uh, other people in the audience have hit on the it's sort of a religion. And someone just said, uh, Global warming seems like the religion of the seculars, and it's hard to do conversions. Religion conversions are difficult. What's the hope? Can those people be converted? <sighs> it's a very hard. In fact, in my sequel, I'm going through all the clips. I have Harrison Ford, the actor, say that uh, they, basically he basically says that the environment became kind of like a religion for him, and the people seeking something, they find it in these causes, in this movement, it becomes their passion. As I said, the head of the UN climate panel said global warming is my religion. How do you deprogram them? I, you know, other people have called it the occult-like because they have such adherence, you can't dissent, your career is over, there's no you know, free will associated, so it's not really, you, you don't even really consider it a religion. I don't know how you would convert it, but you just have to try to open people's eyes and maybe they'll seek fulfillment elsewhere. But right now, a lot of people seek fulfillment in feeling good. In fact, Mark Stein had a great line, climate change is, one of the, only, is the only weird thing where people feel good about feeling bad. <laughs> and that's, that's the only way I can explain it. So until we can reverse that, I don't know how to get people out. Well, that's actually a wonderful segue because the next question, I really love it because it's kind of a little bit of an insult. What happened to that guy with a hockey stick? Don't know his name, yes. but what happened to that? That's Professor Michael Mann. He is doing great. He's a UN lead author. He's quoted all over the media, very active. He testifies in front of Congress. The hockey stick graph basically said temperatures were flat for the 1,000 years, 900 years, and then suddenly in the 20th century, they skyrocketed. This study has been the most debunked study in science. I have, and, and uh, scientists after scientists, institutions, peer-reviewed studies show medieval warm period, the little ice age temperatures were fluctuating he was criticized for the way he came up with that but the UN went with it and that became the icon of the movement but Michael Mann was also implicated this same scientist in the in the climate gate scandal he was caught trying to evade uh, the Freedom of Information Act requests and uh, and he was part of that little click of UN scientists controlling the narrative like a campaign cause but to answer your question he's been rewarded he's doing great you know he's all over the media and he's there considered their foremost expert uh, this is a, uh, I think we know the answer, but I'd uh, love to hear your comments on it. Scott Pruitt seems so effective. Uh, Why did he have to leave? That's a great question. Uh, very simply, he was made an example of. He was the only, let's go through this. Trump did not pick a great cabinet when it came to climate and environment. He picked Rex Tillerson, Exxon Mobil CEO, who was a disaster from our point of view. He, one of his first acts was to go to the Arctic and sign a UN declaration. Uh, he supported carbon taxes. He supported the United States saying in the UN Paris Agreement. Uh, Rick Perry has been a huge disappointment at energy. He used to be a climate skeptic, Texas governor. He now says he and Al Gore have the same goals. He wanted President Trump to stay in the UN Paris Agreement. Uh, the head of NASA named Bridenstein was a skeptic and then before his confirmation he switched. So to answer your question, only one cabinet member talked climate science and pushed back, Scott Pruitt. He was attacked, the EPA bureaucracy, the media, daily. He was held to a standard no other cabinet had ever been held to. He's probably the most effective cabinet member in his little over a year in office that we've seen uh, probably since Reagan's first term. No other cabinet had been that head, had been that effective in just going through and wiping out uh, President Obama's climate agenda and for his troubles his wife wanted a sought help getting influence getting a Chick-fil-A franchise oh my gosh run him out of, an administration official who's trying to use influence and power they held him to a standard no one else did they set an example and the new EPA chief Andrew Wheeler actually the guy that hired me to work in the United States Senate Environment and Public Works 
He's very quiet on the science. Everyone is quiet on the science. Scott Pruitt was made an example of what happens to you if you dare speak out. The only person in the administration vocal, actually it's, it's um, John Bolton, President Trump, and Will Happer. Everyone else is terrified of the science. It's sad. But yeah, to answer the question, uh, Scott Pruitt was made an example and throw, basically forced out of Washington, uh, and everyone gets the message. You, you know, questioning their religion of climate change has its consequences. There are a few questions, questioners in here that wanted your comments on nuclear. Nuclear. Uh, there's a man named Michael Schellenberger, who actually ran for governor, but he's, a, he's considered Time's hero of the environment. And there's a whole contingent of environmentalists who are nuclear. One of the things I'd say is, I, you know, and I worked in the Senate environment. We did all the, stu all the nuclear hearings. I just don't know that much is happening uh, in terms of legislatively, although it's maybe looking a little bit brighter. But one of the funniest lines was Freakonomics authors who said, if you're worried about global warming, blame Jane Fonda. Her 1979 film, The China Syndrome, scared the public so much about nuclear that, we've, you know, that we, it's almost impossible to get new nuclear plants. But nuclear is there, and they're still working on efficiency, but it's a huge political hurdle. I just don't know. I don't have too much optimism, but it's still going to be a big, important part of the mix. But the more environmentalists realize how good uh, nuclear is, if you're worried about emissions, it's hard to believe you'd be opposed to nuclear. But other people like James Hansen from NASA, huge climate activist, uh, he's actually pro-nuclear. So they're, they're out there and it could be growing on the environmental left. This next question is kind of interesting. How much money is being spent on climate change? Could you even guess? It must oh, be... It's so hard. I mean, interesting. Uh, yeah, in, I have a whole chapter on climate finance, but NBC News, others, ExxonMobil has given the 16 to 19 million to groups skeptical of global warming over two decades. This was back in 2007. Same time frame, uh, ExxonMobil gave $100 million to Stanford University to study climate change. $100 million to basically do alarmist studies at, at, at academia. Uh, and then you have the, the Sierra Club got $30 million, almost $30 million, to, to support um, natural, um, natural gas over coal. So you have all these big oil companies giving money, plus you have all the federal grants. It's in the, uh, at this point, tens of billions in terms of the climate research. When you get into the climate movement, which includes all the green energy mandates, it's in the hundreds of billions, and all the proposals are now, I think, I can't remember which candidate, I want to say it's Better O'Rourke or someone's like one to two trillion spending on all this climate-related fear, and the money is just spent like water. But it is David versus Goliath. Climate skeptics get virtually nothing, and industry stopped supporting any of them years ago. It's all, it's, it's the, the David versus Goliath. Goliath is the global warming industry and it's academia, media, and all these international organizations. This question deals going back to the population bomb. Why was it so wrong? What were those false assumptions? I love it. In uh, 19, I think it was like 1971 or two, John Lennon with Yoko Ono went on Dick Cavett. And Dick Cavett was all excited about the Paul Ehrlich's book and telling John Lennon. And John Lennon, it's a great clip. You can see it on YouTube. He's like, oh, that's not going to happen. These things will sort themselves out. There's no population problem. That's nonsense. This is all. And Dick Cavett couldn't believe he said it. He was the climate denier of the day. He was a population denier. It turns out they were just outrageously wrong estimates. And to give you an example, Paul Ehrlich just extrapolated into the future all this gloom and doom. And here's what he did. He gave 10-year, 15-year deadlines, proven wrong on all of them. They learn from his past mistakes. Now most of these, they'll try to say, by the time they come up with doom, a lot of people are dead. They've learned to extend their deadlines so that they won't be alive to face the retribution. <laughs> but basically, the overpopulation scare just didn't account for as countries got wealthier, population started declining. And that's what we're seeing uh, in the developed world. As they get more and more fossil-based fuels, economic growth, they start having less kids and you end up with stabilizing in populations and eventually declining. They were just wrong on the basic modeling of it all and of society. Could you explain the greenhouse effect and the theory, is it right or wrong? And why is it right or wrong? The greenhouse effect, yeah, that's interesting because there is some controversy of how it's presented. It's basically the carbon dioxide builds up in the atmosphere, creates sort of like a blanket, and then it traps in the heat, uh, and then it, it can't escape from our atmosphere, and it heats it up. 
The problem with that is there's so many other factors that mitigate that and water vapor is a much more potent greenhouse gas that you know at one point when they were declaring carbon dioxide a pollutant I had scientists like climatologist Dr. Roger Pilkey say we should be banning water vapor we should be banning garden hoses and swimming pools if we're actually worried about the alleged greenhouse heating effect of carbon dioxide but yes carbon dioxide can have a heating impact on the climate but it's not the control knob and you can't fiddle this natural Natural emissions and human emissions, which are such a tiny fraction, you can't fiddle at the margins with this you know, human CO2 emissions and expect to have any difference um, on our planet in terms of temperature, storminess. It's just, uh, it, it does not support it at all in the geologic peer review. I think almost every session, no matter who we bring as a speaker, there's always a, a question or two about what can we do to reverse what's happening with our children and the question yes. about what's in biology books in college and, and even in high school what could be done about that if anything well I actually testified at Common Core hearings in West Virginia and tried to get involved because the, the new Common Core standards which states are starting to adopt are there's no dissent all scientists agree and, and this is what we're finding we have a group called collegiates for a constructive tomorrow and just seven eight years ago conservative kids libertarian kids were all skeptical but because of that indoctrination which starts at kindergarten all the way through they're all now they're totally are shocked that there's any dissent on global warming and that's what's happening I have a whole chapter in the book on it I guess my book would go through and it, it, one way you could do it, treat it like a coffee table book make your kids look <laughs> at relevant chapters especially the simple stuff like whether there's a 97 percent but basically you have to expose the kids at a young age and tell them basically like the 60s taught the counterculture question authority question the UN question you know what the government is claiming and look at the motives behind it and then just look at the basic science Take homeschooling. There you go. <laughs> That's a, one of the best things you can do. <laughs> yeah, actually, we're working on a curriculum for homeschool and private school. It will never be adopted by you know the public schools, but a curriculum that would give people more science-based, uh, and we might be ho hopefully get a collaboration with some scientists that would give people a basic premise on environmentalism because that's the area that's been so politicized: environmentalism, climate. Well, here's something close to home. I'm glad someone wrote this in. In California, we are PG&E, which is our our power company, is marketing a wildfire prevention program, shutting off power to cities when it's hot and hot and windy. I think I had heard that. Yeah, he's laughing. No, I think they're actually pr proposing. Well, what's that. the premise? Your the thoughts? idea is the, the the lower emissions or no to are they save, worried right? That, are they worried it's that the, the wind is going to hit a power line and it's going to spark a tree? Does anyone know? It's for fire. Oh, I, I don't know enough about what the premise. I'd have to see that. I don't know enough about that. I mean, I don't know if, if they're arguing it's emissions or they're arguing that it's going to spark a fire. That's different. Fire. Okay. No, it's fire. fire. It's for okay. fire. Okay, we'll just do a few more here. I think half of you wrote questions, so we're obviously not going get, get to um, get, get through all these. But let's see. Another good one. Let me one here. Um, yeah, since you acknowledge that Congress won't stop subsidizing some form of, some form of energy, what would you support directly, directing those subsidies? You know, besides well, nuclear, I think would be the obvious choice. But are there any? You know, should government do more, do less, e equal? I, I don't know. I mean, I'm at the point where it's when Trump first came in they had all these grand plans uh, uh, um, his office of management and budget director came out was going to do a third cut in the EPA budget stop funding climate change musical they actually have the climate change federally funded climate change musical and the report his whole budget with all these big cuts in this, and, and even climate research dead on arrival in a Republican Congress and Senate just dead so I, I've given up in terms of Washington ever changing that. Their money is just their record spending, record deficits, record debt. That's just not going to happen anytime soon. There's no Republicans, even including President Trump, who are going to do anything about that. One of the interesting ideas is, though, instead of trying to make a futile attempt to cut, if they would start rediverting the money to skeptical scientists and scientists outside the government for research in other words and also do a study to affect to study the ocean cycles or solar effect on climate you would start getting a different thing actually allocate money outside of the usual suspects that's something we could do very practically but in terms of cutting the budget I mean how can anyone who's gonna cut the budget you have all three branches of government and you can't even make even cosmetic cuts that's I don't know I don't have the answer for cutting the budget that's never gonna happen mm -hmm. in, our, in our lifetime probably until we have a financial collapse of some sort 
Well, I'm not aware of this, uh, this phrase, but maybe other people have. This person says they've heard the refrain, it's too late. Uh, who would say that? Yes. But why isn't the other side giving up if it's all too? Well, that's a, it's a weird thing because sometimes sometimes they say they'll give you a tip. But my favorite was Prince Charles. He gave a hundred month tipping point, and he actually counted down ninety months. We must act eighty seven months, and then the hundred months passed, and he was silent. And I followed this. It's actually a whole segment of my movie. And after my first movie came out, I was like, "How is he going to handle this? The deadline's passed. The tipping point passed." He then, about a year later, issued a new tipping point of like 2040, and he'll be like almost 100 years old. He could actually make his new deadline because he's got the royal blood that's very long, uh, longevity in his blood. So, uh, what's the question was again on? Why don't, they, why don't they just give up? Oh, so why there's certain activists out there, and I feature them in my second film, who actually just think it's too late, that we've already, we had to terminate industrial civilization, we didn't make it, uh, and that there's nothing we can do, we're in for a really rough time, in which case I say, great, then it's over, let's just live our lives, be happy, and not worry about it. But there's a whole set of activists who actually believe it's over, and they're very pessimistic, and they'll actually be featured in my sequel. Yeah. <laughs> Towards the end of your talk, you mentioned that one report that you'd like to get passed. So just basically, what are the best ways for us to push back? Well, I think the, the single best way is to de... You've got to push, you've got to be not afraid, you've got to get your political leaders in town halls and meetings and exchanges with media not to be afraid to talk about what's behind this and to actually cite hard data, especially on extreme weather. That's a new, I remember when I was in Bali 2007, John McCain's top climate aide said, we're going to be focusing on extreme weather. I go, I go, how could you possibly do that? That's the, most, the dumbest argument. No one's going to buy it. I was wrong. They started, and that was 2007. That became the mantra now. Michael Mann, who someone asked about, says, if you want to know what global warming is doing, look out your living room window. It's just such nonsense. So what you can do is demystify it. Not, it the idea is if you believe in climate change, you're a good person. If you don't, you're an evil denier. We've got to give politicians the courage to question it. You can't just be against a policy because, oh, it's too expensive, or I don't support a regulation. You've got to be against it because the premise is wrong. And that's where we failed, and that's where we continue to fail. If President Trump doesn't do this climate commission, which is the single most important thing to come along in the 40-year debate, I don't know what the future is, especially even if President Trump's reelected, it just means a pause, but they're going to be ready to go after mm -hmm. the next four years with all of this, and there's still no one pushing back. Again, federal judges, all they have are UN reports, and we're not going to get good court rulings our way because the government is accepting science that, doesn't even, that violates the basic standard of science that's put forward by the Department of Energy. And I have a section on that in the book to tell you that the UN science is, actually violates our science our standards. Okay, we're all depressed now. But no, it's not depressing. This cl climate commission is the greatest thing that could happen, and it's like we'll I'd say it's fifty-fifty right now. That's all where right, we are right great. now. That's that's the most important thing. Thank you so much. This was fantastic, and see you all next. Thank month. you very much. Appreciate it.